Okay, let's have a look at uh, global addressing with the internet protocol. So there's a, uh, well, <laughs> originally we had uh, with IPv4, uh, these splits into class A, class B and class C networks. So you have a 32 bit address space. So this means that you have two to the power of 32, about 4 billion possible addresses. Um, and that they should be globally unique. And again, we'll talk about network address translation and other causes of non-global uniqueness and how that's addressed later. But for now, we'll make that assumption of global uniqueness. So if the first bit is a zero, so that's half of the addresses, then it's a type A address. Uh, so this means that there are seven bits of network address and 24 bits of host address. Uh, so that means there can only be 128 uh, of these um, class A networks. And they were typically allocated, uh, a few universities had them very early on, uh, but mostly large companies would have been allocated them uh, quite early on. So for example, 10, the 10 network that's actually now used for a different purpose was originally one of these because um, 10, if we put that into binary in that first byte position is less than 128, which means that the seventh bit, the top bit will be zero and therefore it would be a class A address. Um, a class B address has a one and a zero in the first two bits and then 14 bits of network and then 16 bits of host. So this means it will be where the first byte is between 128 and 191. Uh, so for example, Flinders University where I work um, has 129.96 as the first two bytes. So its network number is 129.96 and then it has 16 bits of, uh, net, of host address. So it can have two to the power of 16 is 60, you know, 65,536 hosts uh, in principle in there. And in the class A, you've got 24 bits of hosts. You can have over 16 million hosts uh, in there. Uh, and then we have class C networks. So they start with two ones and then a zero in the top bits. So this will be addresses from 192 up, not to 255, because 240 to 255 is reserved uh, in IPv4 and effectively not usable. And then 21 bits of network address. So that's 2 million possible networks. Whereas up here, we had 16,000 possible networks and up here we only had 128. Um, and you're probably getting the sense, if you think globally, there's probably more networks than that, or certainly we'd be getting toward that limit uh, already. Uh, and so uh, on these class C network addresses, there's only eight bits for host. So that's 256, two to the power of eight is 256. Um, and so when this addressing scheme was, uh, was in use, uh, you could request class C addresses in particular, even as a, a small organization quite readily. So back in the mid nineties, I actually uh, had allocated uh, to my own personal business two class C address uh, blocks. Um, so I control 512 of the roughly 4 billion IPv4 addresses because they were allocated to me uh, in that regard. And again, this is the key that it's, they're allocated out to individual entities, uh, businesses or otherwise, who will then use them however they wish internally. The host part, they can do whatever they like with uh, for their networks. And um, if we look at the way that we write down an IP address, again, it's 32 bits for an IPv4 address. We write it with the, by the decimal value of each byte of that four bytes that makes up the 32 bits from left to right. So 10.3.2.4, the first byte would be 10, the second byte would be three, the next byte would be two, and the last byte would be four uh, in terms of the values stored in them. So if we want to forward um, IP datagrams, um, every IP datagram we saw in the header, right? If we go back to the header. Uh, a few slides. The destination address is stored in every uh, IP packet. So we can use that to work out where to send things to. So if a, um, the IP address is on the same network as uh, the sender, then this is local to that network. There's no need to send it uh, off to a um, part of me, a different network, we can deliver it, we can forward it directly to the, uh, the recipient because they're directly connected to us. Now, if they're not directly connected uh, on the same network, we have to send it to some router uh, to send it through. Uh, 
So each network will have one or more routers defined for it, uh, for IPv4 networks. Uh, and there'll be a, a routing table, uh, a forwarding table in effect. Um, sorry, there'll be a routing table that says where to find each of the, um, uh, the networks uh, on the, the internet, some of which may be collected together to basically say the rest of the internet is then via some particular link. Uh, and of course, to do this routing, computers and nodes, uh, switching equipment and routers need to be able to connect to more than one IP network interface at a time. Uh, so typically, this will mean that hosts will have some kind of forwarding table where they know which network numbers are connected onto which interfaces. And then they'll often have a default route, which is so this is where the rest of the internet is kind of viewed as being connected to, that it will send to instead. Uh, and so each router, in effect, behaves in the same way. It knows where to find uh, different networks so that can forward things on, and it knows where its default route is. So again, if we think back to that diagram, so if we look at for router two, so we have the, um, uh, the different interfaces and routers on there. So let's go back. Uh, here, so router 2 uh, has connections to router 1 and router 3. Uh, and it may also have other uh, connections in there. So it knows that uh, the networks for router 2 and router 3 uh, are networks 1 and 4, for instance. And it knows to send it on to, uh, uh, to those uh, connected interfaces. And then it might have other interfaces as well uh, that it supports. So if we look at that uh, bit of pseudocode, if the network number of the destination is a network number of one of the interfaces that's directly connected to a host, then deliver the packet directly to that destination. Um, alternatively, um, if the network number is listed in the forwarding table, in the routing table for that node, and it knows a particular uh, interface, a particular router uh, that it should forward those packets to, then it should do so. Otherwise, it should deliver to the default router, so the fallback router in effect. Um, and for hosts that only have one interface, this is a little bit easier. Um, essentially, if it's on the same network, then deliver it directly. Otherwise, deliver it to the default router because there can be no choice as to where to send it. Um, and the key is whether, when the packet is sent on, whether the encapsulation addresses it to go directly to the destination or whether it addresses it to the default router. So on an Ethernet, for example, um, if you're delivering directly, you'll have to have the Ethernet address that matches that IP address to send it to. Um, or if you don't, if it's not on the same network, you would send it to the Ethernet address that corresponds to the IP address of the default router. Uh, but the packet so IP address will still be the actual the the end destination IP address. So. We saw previously that the, um, you know, with the, the class A, B, and C networks, these are quite large, particularly for A and B, and even for C, you may want to further subdivide uh, a network down to a, a smaller piece, into a subnet. And so to do this, you work out how many bits are going to be for the subnet number, and they get all get set to one. And then how many bits are for the, um, the host number, they get set to zero. And if we treat that as an IP address uh, in terms of writing it, we can do that. So in this case, we've got 24 ones and eight zeros. So that subnet mask would be written as 255 because that's what uh, an eight bit byte with all ones in every bit uh, will be equal to. 255.255.255, that gets us through three times eight is 24 ones. Dot zero, because the last eight bits are zero, um, all zeros in binary will be zero in decimal. So now we have a subnetted address that has the network number, which is still the same length as it originally was. Um, and then the subnet ID, which is the part uh, within that, um, that's still being used for network, but is not part of the true network number. And then finally the host ID uh, for the last part. Now the subnet masks um, to the, the global internet don't actually mean anything. Uh, they're really, a, they're a, administrative uh, convenience uh, to be able to divide up a large network internally within an organization. And as we say, typically class A and B networks, uh, this will happen with because they're so large, uh, but you can uh, subnet within a class C, in which case you have less than eight bits of host ID. So you have a subnet mask that would probably be 255.255.255. Dot something other than zero, like dot 240 would mean that four more bits were used for the uh, network part and only four bits were available for the host part. 
So we'll attack this in the, uh, the next video.